Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher. Still in New York City, and this week I want to jump right in, introduce my special guest. It's going to be her first appearance here on the podcast, and uh, but she is no stranger to tournament poker. She has over a quarter million dollar in total live earnings. She's also been absolutely crushing it lately on Ignition Poker, where she recently won the uh, main event for the week, as well as took second in the High Roller that week on the very same day. So please welcome, uh, for the first time here on the show, Elena Stover. Hi, Elena. Hi. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. So uh, like most poker players, um, you started out your poker career by getting a PhD in neuroscience. Is that correct? Yeah, that seems to be the usual track for um, the average poker player. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, if I heard this story once, I heard it a million times. You know, I went to nine years of college to get a Ph.D., did my dissertation and got right into the online streets. I mean, that's that's pretty much what we all did, you know. Yeah, yeah. Pretty basic. (laughs) Yeah. So it's been a long time since you are uh, were in that space because you've actually been playing poker professionally for for how long now? Um, Well, I started playing about 10 years ago, right before Black Friday, and then um, I've been, I would say, a professional since around 2014, so I guess that's about six, seven years at this point, so yeah, it's kind of a distant past as far as the academic stuff goes, but, um, you know, I'll always have love for that space, but yeah, preferably keep that space away from me. Yeah, you can love it from afar. Exactly, yeah. yeah. (laughs) You got me. (laughs) Yeah, so you are on Twitter, uh, the groupie on Twitter, and you're pretty active. Uh, you and I have actually never met in person. I don't, I don't believe, but uh, I'm, you know, we have had some pretty interesting and lively discussions about various topics on Twitter, and you're a very fun follow. So I recommend everybody check out the groupie on Twitter. But uh, one thing that we uh, kind of got into was when Andrew and I were first having our discussion about comedy and you basically told me that you are not a fan of stand-up comedy and very few people actually say that so uh you care to explain yourself wow i feel like you're really putting me on the spot right now (laughs) it's all tongue-in-cheek no but basically andrew and i were arguing and i actually ended up uh if those anyone who hasn't heard it yet um last week there was an episode where andrew brokus and i were on his podcast the thinking poker podcast which you've also been on but it's been a few years um well andrew and i were debating uh political correctness and how it relates to stand-up comedy and comedians and you basically said that you you don't go to comedy clubs and then i said well i guess as the groupie you're not a comedy groupie and then you replied are there really such people out there and and the answer is no (laughs) no there aren't (laughs) (laughs) okay so I guess, um, yeah, I I like comedy. Um, I've never actually been to a comedy show, though. So, I mean, I feel like maybe I was only saying that out of inexperience. I don't know. Maybe if I actually went to a comedy show, I would find it more entertaining. I've only seen, like, you know, HBO specials, things on TV. And I feel like those are a little bit stiff, you know, like a little bit kind of predictable, For sure. Yeah, I would agree with that. And we're not going to get too deep into comedy, but I did want to ask you about that. I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm sorry if I offended you. I mean, (laughs) it was kind of my intention to offend you at the time, but (laughs) but not not in all seriousness. So, you know. Yeah, no, believe me. um, You know, with with my career path, uh, being a poker playing comedian, uh, it is incredibly hard to offend me. So don't worry, you did not. But yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because I found it. Uh, interesting. I always like to see uh, where people land on the spectrum. Like if you've never actually been to a comedy club, and you've only seen stand up on TV. It is totally different. So maybe report back to us if you ever do make it to a comedy show. And I'd like to invite you 
to come see my show if you ever make it back to New York. I know that you used to live here years ago, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, I love going back to New York. I still have a lot of friends there, and I would love to take you up on that. So let me know when your next show is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm doing shows uh, almost every night now. Uh, New York is is getting back to normal, finally, after this uh, pandemic that basically shut down all of my places of business for over a year. Uh, Things are finally getting a little bit back to normal. If you call audience wearing masks and being six feet apart from each other normal, but uh, at this point we'll take it because it was it was really hard not not having that creative outlet for myself. Um, so what about you? When you're not playing poker, uh, what sort of outlets do you have? Um, I have a few different hobbies. Um, most of them just revolve around sitting in the same chair that I play poker in and. Um, typing things on different websites other than poker websites. Um, I do really like word games, though. So um, I'm a big uh, Boggle aficionado. I don't know if you're familiar with that game. Sure, I love um, Boggle. The letters, and you have to figure out what words you can make out of the letters that are exactly. that are there. Yeah, it's a great game. Love Boggle. Yeah, so I love Boggle. And uh, some of my old Boggle friends have actually started getting really active um, in in the Scrabble space, so Scrabble is making like this huge like splash on Twitch right now. So there's like this whole Scrabble community that um, during the pandemic. So Scrabble is much like poker in terms of like the tournament scene. So they have like all these different tournaments every year in all these different cities, and all the players go to all the tournaments, and so they have like you know, friends who they meet up with and they stay at hotels with and they go to dinner. It's very much like the tournament poker scene. And so when that was taken away, they had to kind of move everything online. And so there's been this big boom of um, Scrabble um, Twitch events like tournaments and just, um, you know, different people starting uh, streams. And um, yeah, that's that's basically like been my main hobby outside of poker um, for the last couple months. So when you're not playing this game, you're playing that game. You just like games. Yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> no, that's cool. I mean, that's that's kind of like the uh, the household that I grew up in. A lot of our listeners know this about me, but my mother was a professional poker player for a number of years and also uh, very uh, active and, and serious about other games. Like if I played backgammon against my mother at age nine, I had to be ready to take a beating, and she wasn't afraid to use the doubling cube. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, let's let the little kids win in my house. If you won, it's because you really won. And so, uh, yeah, we all grew up with playing pretty much every game under the sun. I'm no stranger to Boggle, although it sounds like you could probably uh, school me in Boggle, don't you think? Uh, yeah, if if you're not a seasoned Boggle player, I definitely <laughs> have an advantage, I would think. Definitely was not expecting to hear the term seasoned Boggle player come out of your <laughs> mouth tonight. So that's that's kind of cool. <laughs> that's awesome. So uh, how big is the Boggle community? I know Scrabble's a thing. Scrabble's been a thing for a long time, but I didn't realize Boggle was so so uh, strong and mighty. So what's happening in, in the Boggle world? Well, I mean, pretty much nothing. So Boggle has been a much smaller community than Scrabble. Um, There's not really a tournament scene. Um, There's only like a few different websites where people play online. Um, But um, the word game community has a lot of overlap. So a lot of people who like Scrabble like Boggle and vice versa. Um, So hopefully, you know, I don't know if there's ever going to be a market for like live Boggle tournaments. But if there is, like, I'm going to definitely be there. Yeah, well, maybe we should start that up. I mean, if if Scrabble's doing well on Twitch, then who's to say Boggle couldn't be the next Scrabble? Why not? Right. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, why not? All right, cool. So, all right, so this is uh, Tournament Boggle Edge (laughs) (laughs) podcast. Uh, All right, so we talked a lot more about Boggle than I expected to, but, you know, I'm not not mad at it. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, I know that you have a hand or two that you wanted to uh, share with us. Uh, today, which is great. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you, I did a little bit of research on you, and I I see that you have lived all over the world. So where are you based now, and are you playing live poker these days? Um, Yes. Okay. So yes, I have lived in a lot of different places, and I'm currently based on the East Coast. And I have been basically in a COVID bubble for uh, pretty much ever since it started. So I have not ventured out 
into the live poker scene yet. Um, the casinos around here are open and I've just kind of been waiting for the right time to re-emerge into the world, if you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. I think we're all kind of on our own individual timelines. You know, some people were super comfortable jumping back right back in as soon as they opened the casinos and others are kind of waiting to get their feet wet or whatever. I did see that the WPT had a record field in the uh, Florida event down in yeah. Hollywood, Florida recently. Yeah, I saw that. That was crazy. Yeah, that that appears to be a good sign. Um, it was certainly the announcement that there will be a full WSOP slate in Vegas, although it won't be in the summer like usual. It's going to be in the fall. Are you planning to venture out there uh, in September, October? Well, you know what? So um, I also saw, um, I think Kev Math had tweeted it, that some of the other casinos are, in fact, going to do some series um, during the summer when the usual WSOP would have been. And to be honest, so I, I go every year. I think every year since 2010, I've gone out to Vegas for the World Series. And so with the exception of last year, it's sort of a yearly ritual for me. And... You know, the Rio is not my favorite place to play poker, if we're all <laughs> completely honest. And I actually love playing at places like Wynn and Aria and, you know, even Venetian. I was boycotting the Venetian for a number of years because of the whole Sheldon Adelson connection and, sure. you know, his lobbying against online poker. But now that he's dead, I feel like it's sort of, you know, open season on the Venetian. So, you know, if they're having a summer series, you know, if Ari and Wynn are going to do something, like, I think I might check it out this summer, even if there's no WSOP, because I kind of, I like playing in some of those other casinos actually even better. Yeah, I think a lot of us do. It's just you kind of feel like you want to do bracelet hunting or whatever. And, I mean, certainly the games in the summer during the World Series have always been kind of notoriously good. I mean, especially if you select well and you play any game that has a a, a special name, like the Goliath or the the Super Tournament or you know, all the different the Millionaire Maker, all the different names that they come up with for these weekend tournaments for the people that are kind of taking a shot, weekend warriors on vacation, whatever. Uh, yeah, they can be really, really good. Of course, the Rio deep stacks are usually a lot of fun during the World Series. But, uh, yeah, if that's not going to be going on, but the other casinos are going to take this opportunity to make it their summer, uh, yeah, I might have to go out there at that point, too. Yeah, I haven't been back to a casino yet since, you know, before the pandemic. But I'm kind of like you. I'm sort of itching to get back into it and, and waiting to pick my spot to when I'm going to uh, – to get back in there. I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to wear a mask all day for 12 hours. So that's the thing. I'm waiting for things to calm down enough that we don't actually need to have the masks, especially going to have plexiglass and a mask and everything else. I'm not sure. It's just, I'm not that comfortable with a mask on. See, I, yeah. I mean, I haven't spent much time out with the mask on just because I haven't spent that much time out. So I'm not sure how I would feel about it, but I think the plexiglass sounds great, honestly, because number one, it's, it's, Forcing them to have eight-handed tables, which is amazing. Love that. Right. Because normally you go to Vegas in the summer, you go to, to a WSOP event, you're playing ten-handed, and it's a tiny-ass table on like rickety stilts, <laughs> and like yeah, <laughs> with, like a bunch of dudes. Like, and I mean, let's be real here. Like, Americans aren't really known for being that svelte. Like, <laughs> yeah, you you can't jam ten of us around one of those little tables and expect it to be comfortable. So, I mean, if anything good comes out of this pandemic, if we can get eight handed tables for the rest of the existence of poker, like, I feel like that'll be a huge win. I, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I hate, I hate sitting 10 handed, uh, especially in the States where our people tend to be uh, larger than average, uh, you know, exactly. globally. <laughs> um, there's that, but there's also the, the thrill of playing eight handed, which is just more action, you know, less folding. So I like that too. Yeah. So I feel, I feel like I would kind of enjoy some of the pandemic restrictions and also just like, you know, them keeping it cleaner because also casinos in general are not usually the most um, hygienic places. So 
I feel like the pandemic, um, I don't know, restrictions are can, can have a positive effect. Um, but I agree with you that having to wear masks inside all day sounds a little bit confining. So, yeah, I'm just kind of waiting to see how things pan out, how they go. I mean, they just released the CDC recommendation that people don't have to wear masks outside anymore unless you're in a crowd, right? So Yeah, so but, things are moving in the right direction. They also announced this week that, at least here in New York City, the plan is to reopen the whole city with no restrictions July 1st. And I've, oh, seen, wow. I've seen other places that are already fully open. So maybe uh, there are, is reason for optimism after what has been just a, a ridiculous year uh, in so many ways. So it sounds like maybe we'll both be in Vegas at least for a little bit of the summer and possibly again in the fall if things go well. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Like, I'm all about it. Like, I think this summer is going to be super fun because I think everyone is just ready to get out there. Like, we've all missed out on so much over this past year. and. It's kind of time to get it to get it back, you know. Absolutely. To get, back, to get the fun back, to get summer back. Yeah. All those things. Yeah, let's take it all back. It, it, it's been away from us for too long. Exactly. I mean, it hasn't been a terrible uh, pandemic for you, at least here towards the end. I mean, if you look at your most recent tweet, you won the Ignition Casino Sunday Major, and also got second in the High Roller on the same day. So. Uh, you know, first off, congratulations. What a day. Thank you. Yeah, that was unexpected. I almost wish that it had happened on two different days because it was like too much excitement for one day, you know, because yeah. most Sundays are just complete shit. And you're just like, oh, my God, <laughs> I I lost 3K again. Like, fuck my life. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like, well, I wish that could have been spread over two really happy Sundays, but I will definitely take that one Sunday. I'm not complaining. Yeah, at to all. be clear, she is not complaining. No hate mail, please. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, tell us how that feels um, to have such an amazing Sunday. Um, you know, was your bankroll uh, due for a big boost like this, or have things been generally going pretty well the last few months? Kind of give us a sense of where you were at before this happened and how it feels now. Yeah, I mean, things have actually been going really well for me during the pandemic. So, it, you know, it definitely wasn't a case of like, you know, desperation, like, oh, I need this money or I'm going to be like out on the street or, you know, anything like that. But, you know, it's just so exciting when you get deep in a tournament, especially when it's like a major tournament and like the major tournament. And you're just like, OK, you know, like all right, down to three tables. OK, let's not get ahead of ourselves. You know, like we got to play good poker. And then it's up to two tables and you're like, all right, it's almost the final table. Like we got to keep our cool. You know, it's kind of like like a big mind fuck. And it's so exciting. But then like you also have to like play really good poker. So, yeah, I mean, it's just like all that stuff all at once. And then after. So the first tournament, the the main event that I won, um, ended like a couple hours before um, the high roller. So after I won the first one, I was just like freaking out. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I still have this other tournament that I'm really deep in as well. And I'm like, okay, like I have to fucking focus. Like I can, you know, like 40K is great, but like I could, you know, potentially win another 30K, I think was the top prize on the high roller. So, you know, I really had to kind of, like rein myself in after I won the first tournament and, um, you know, pay attention and focus on the second one. So I did completely blow that. And yeah, I mean, I was so happy and lucky to again, finish, um, in the place that I did. So yeah, it's just, yeah, it was really awesome. Yeah. Normally if you're a live player, there's no other tournament still going on at the time that you get a, a trophy. <laughs> right. I just finished in first place in something. Now it's time to go pop some bottles. So in, exactly. in your case, you had to kind of wait to celebrate because you were still, you know, doing okay in the, in the high roller. And then you end up getting second place in that one as well. So uh, what a day, what, what was the total for the two tournaments that day? Um, it was around 40 K. Yeah. The first one was about 39 and the second was about 21. So yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> or sorry, yeah. Like 60 something. Yeah. Yeah. I think I just messed up the numbers, but yeah. Something yeah. Big. 
it's a uh, it's a good day by any measure. So uh, let me ask you this before we get to your hands um, or hand, depending on how much time we have. Uh, what is your general approach? I mean, are you like a GTO bot? Do you try to just keep everything as balanced as you can? Do you uh, take notes on your opponents and try to exploit their tendencies or kind of give us a sense of when you fire up a, a poker tournament, what, what is your uh, general approach to playing? Um, I think I try to play a solid game. I, I think I try to sort of adhere to like the GTO principles. Um, but I think, um, especially when it gets into the later stages, that my game tends to be more on the exploitative uh, end of things than on the GTO end of things. Um, because I do pay a lot of attention to what my opponents are doing, and I do take a lot of notes. Um, I like to color code people, so I have, you know, my color system, and I tend to mark everyone as soon as I have a big enough hand sample, um, just as a sort of visual heuristic for myself, so I can look around the table and say, like, okay, like, this guy's passive, this guy's tight, this guy's loose, this guy's aggressive. Um, especially when you're multi-tabling, I just find that to be, like, a useful tool for me. Um, and then I tend to look for ways that I can capitalize on um, the tendencies of the other players. Yeah, I, I think that's very similar to what I do. I, I write away as soon as I think I have a feel. My philosophy is I, I can always change the color later. If, right. I, if I have a sense of how someone plays, I'm going to mark that player a certain color um, and maybe write a few notes. If I'm not sure, I'll put a question mark. You know, is this guy a loose, aggressive maniac? Question mark. And if if he proves himself to be, all I have to do is to, uh, erase that question mark. <laughs> you know? Like, yes, he's confirmed a maniac. So uh, things like that can help a lot, especially if you have a lot of different tables going or any other distractions. Like if you have like four high rollers going and also one game of boggle in the corner. <laughs> it's very important to be able to keep keep up with who's who. <laughs> so. It, it, it's impossible to play Boggle at the same time as online poker because, believe me, I have tried. <laughs> You've tried. Okay, good to know. <laughs> she tried, everybody. It's not possible. Great. I failed. I failed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah it, you're pretty funny, so it's it's interesting to me that you've never been to a comedy show. Even your Twitter, uh, it says, PhD in psychology, recovering academic, poker starlet in training. So uh, what is that training like? We're interested to know. Well, that was that was the first thing I wrote when I joined Twitter, and I've never changed it. And so <laughs> it's, it's been like many years, like over ten years. So I guess I'm not really in training anymore, and I guess I'm also probably not really in contention to be a poker starlet anymore either. So I feel like I'm just kind of like I should change it to be like old poker grumpy woman or something. About, about <laughs> a veteran crusher. How's that? <laughs> Veteran cat lady. Veteran cat lady. All right. Uh, okay. So after this interview, we're going to talk about our cats because I have uh, a little kitty cat that I'm obsessed with too. Uh, oh, really? But I know our listeners want poker content, so we're not going to make this a cat podcast. We can't do Boggle and cats on the same episode. That's one of my rules in my original contract. I'm not going to break it. So uh, we have to do a separate podcast where we talk about cats for 20 minutes and then do a, some uh, strategy. Okay. Okay. All I'm right. On so board. what I'd love to do is uh, if you can kind of set us up what what tournament your hand is from and uh, maybe like what stage of the tournament you're in, like whether you're in the money, close to the money or, or in the beginning, whatever. Um, and then whenever it's your turn to make a decision, before you tell me what you did, let's talk about what your options are and figure out what, what you should do or should have done or, or could have done differently. Um, that's generally how we like to go through the hands. And if you can avoid telling me what your opponent has until the end, that would be great. Okay, so this is a tournament that I played on Ignition last week. Um, it was a 162 buy-in, um, which is one of the higher buy-ins on the site. Um, I think it was on a weekday night. Um, so, yeah, it would have been one of the more high-stakes tournaments for that particular day. So um, it's in the early stages, but I would say early mid stages um, where it's uh, almost the end of late reg, but there's still a couple levels before the end of late reg. Um, and the average stock was 50 big blinds. I had 40 big blinds. Okay. So 
that's sort of the introductory setup. That's a great setup. So we got a real sense of what kind of tournament we're playing and where we are. Uh, just for those who don't have Ignition Casino, such as myself, um, Ignition Poker, I'm looking at, at the uh, at the Twitter handle for Ignition Poker is Ignition Casino, so I got confused. So if, if we're not on Ignition, what kind of feel does this $162 tournament attract? Is it mostly pros? Do you feel like you see a lot of the same people on there? all the time give us a sense of like what the uh the skill level that you're facing in this tournament would be well the thing about ignition is that all the tournaments are anonymous so when you log on and you join a tournament you're given a number based on whatever uh position you were when you joined the tournament so the first person who joins is number one and then the 12th person is number 12. um so it's completely anonymous you have a different number each tournament you play so nobody has any prior stats on anybody. So um, notes that you took on a player, like where you color-coded somebody blue last week, if that same player is in this tournament, you're not going to see that blue. Exactly. It's only for those specific tournaments. Got it. Okay. All right. And so how do these, these players that you've generally seen in tournaments like this on that site, uh, what, how would you describe their playing style? I would say the general playing pool is very soft. Um more soft than the other U.S. sites, for sure. Definitely way more soft than any of the international sites. Um, yeah, I would say it's probably the softest site to play on right now. There's a lot of, um, you know, people you would describe as a classical fish player who are kind of like passive, limpy. They want to see a lot of flops. Um, you know, they want to call a lot. And they, you know, they're going to check fold when they don't hit their their hand. Um so it's, yeah, I would say it's the site where you can kind of um, get the biggest bang for your buck. Okay. Yeah, we had Carlos Welch on last week, and he said the same thing about the site. So it's kind of making me want to move out of New York, but <laughs> that's okay. I don't think I can access the site from where I live. So uh, I guess I'm out of luck, at least as far as I know. But maybe offline you can uh, give me some tips if that's the case or not. Anyway, so we're in this $162 tournament, and we're you know up against this general player pool. I mean, certainly there, are, there, there have to be some good players on the site, but you kind of have to figure out who they are. And it's not as brutal as trying to do the same tournament on a Poker Stars International or, or something like that. Yeah, for sure. There are definitely good players who play. And, and, you know, I know, you know, some of my personal friends who are really good players definitely do play on this site. And, yeah, I think um, it's just a question of, like, you know, keeping your eye on how people play. I mean, running a HUD. So Poker Tracker 4 is the HUD I use, and it does work with Ignition. Um, so you can get the hands for your specific tournament. And so you can, you know, it's not going to be a huge sample, but you can get a pretty good sense, you know, after 20, 30 hands, you know, if someone's limping every hand, like that's going to show up pretty quickly. Like you can see that right away, even when you're multi-tabling. For sure. And so you can, you know, you can make adjustments based on a, a relatively small hand sample. Yeah. I mean, if somebody's really that flagrant, with their mistakes, I think you could pick it up relatively quickly. Um, that's what we do in live, right? I mean, if I'm if I'm at your table for an hour, we've probably only played like 30 hands together. So, I, and by yeah. then, after an hour into any live tournament, I have a read on my opponents. Now, part of that is how they look, how they behave. You know, of course, it's not just their what their HUD stats would say. There's a lot more information live, but you know, the game is always going to be a game of incomplete information. So. I'll, I'll acknowledge that I have a small sample size, but if I see something that really sticks out to me, I'll use it. Sure. Why not? Yeah, totally. That's exactly. And I think that your analogy to live poker is so accurate because I feel like in live poker, we kind of overestimate those those live tells or those, you know, the things that we pay attention to live. Like, oh, I noticed this person hasn't played a hand yet because I get that a lot on the reverse angle. Like, I feel like as a female player, people tend to pay a lot of attention to what I'm doing. And if I haven't played a hand in two orbits, then people will start being like, oh, you're so tight. Like, you haven't played a hand. Like, oh, you're just waiting for aces, huh? And it's like, 
you know, I could I could go two orbits online without playing a hand, and it would be completely normal because maybe I just didn't get a hand those two orbits, you know. Yeah, it's not that unusual to fold for two orbits online. I mean, in any tournament, but yeah, I I could see where people would probably take their pre-existing, uh, you know, preconceived notions about how uh, a woman might play, and then if they see you doing that, then it's just like kind of a confirmation bias of sorts. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, so uh, in this event, we have 40 bigs, and what's the action? Okay, so I have pocket eights. I'm under the gun plus two, and I am going to raise two, two big lines, so just a min raise. Okay, um, so they fold to you, and yes. we've got eights. Yeah, I mean, we're going to play this hand, and we're going to raise, and I'm with you with 40 bigs. I don't see any reason to raise any bigger than that. So, yeah, I would agree with the... Uh, with the pre-flop decision to make it two bigs? Sure. Yeah, I mean, different people have different preferences. Like, people do 2.1, 2.3. Um, I'm a little bit lazy in that I don't feel like typing in an extra number. <laughs> Just click so, it. <laughs> just clicking the button for min raise is, like, totally okay with me. Um, so I do that. And then we have a player on the button uh, who we have about 60 hands on. And this player has uh, also 40 big blinds. And he is what we call your stereotypical calling station. So he is very cally. He calls actually 46% of the hands wow. that he's played. Yeah. So he's running um, DPIP 36 over three flop threes 11. So he's very cally, uh, very passive. Um, seems like he wants to see a lot of flops. Okay. So let's assume he's going to call. So he does call. <laughs> right. So, and then, though, there's a player in the small lines who's just got into the table, and we don't have a lot of stats. We have seven hands, um, but he's played so far four out of the seven hands, and he's already three bet once. So, again, very small sample, but it's tending toward uh, possibly a very aggressive style of player. So the small blind uh, raises three bets. Mm -hmm. And he raises to a pretty large sizing. So he raises uh, five times the uh, opening raise to uh, 10 big blinds. Okay. So now it folds to us, and we have a decision with pocket eight. So we raised from early position the button, who's a loose passive type, uh, called, and the small blind three bet to 10 big blinds. And the effective stack is 40 big blinds. Um, you know, yeah. I, I don't have a problem with shoving here. Um, there's already plenty of chips to win out there. Um, your hand is probably, you know, in the long run, you're probably going to be at least 50% when you're called, I think. You know, with, with having eights... And with this guy, if he does end up being a very aggressive three better, then you're usually going to take it down, or at least often you can take it down with a shove here. I think it's a little awkward to call and see a flop because you will have already put in 25% of your stack before the flop with pocket eights, and it's kind of hard to play those middle pairs after the flop. Um, I don't really like folding because uh, I, I just think our eights are good a lot, and we could be getting bullied here and it just kind of sucks to put in 5% of our stack and then have to fold what, what could be the best hand right now. So yeah, I guess as I'm talking it through, I just want to go ahead and shove. Yeah. So definitely like, I feel like every option has certain merits and certain drawbacks. So, you know, initially when I'm three bet, um, in that position with a hand like eights, my first instinct is to flat. But um, it is a rather large sizing. I mean, it's not out of the ordinary, but, um, you know, I feel like a normal three-bat sizing would maybe be a little bit lower than that. Um, and it is a large portion of our stock. So it's hard to see how it would be profitable to flat and really play the hand very well post-flop. 
So it's kind of like, that doesn't seem like a very attractive option. Now, reshoving seems like it could potentially be a good option because, you know, we have the essential dead money from the button. We know he's calling a super wide range and um, he he's probably folding to a 40 big line shove. That's essentially his whole stack as well. Um, and then if we go by our initial, you know, kind of super cursory read of the small blind, he might be trying to just squeeze with a hand that is not necessarily a super strong value hand. So shoving seems attractive too. But then also, you know, it is a higher stakes tournament. Um, buying in again is kind of annoying. So I think folding also is kind of like this sort of low variance option. Yeah, so folding is definitely a low variance option. And if you feel like you'll have a lot of other opportunities to accumulate chips, um, let me ask you this. If you would fold eights, and, and you're not actually telling us that you've done that yet, but if if we're going to fold eights here, would we also fold nines? And would we also fold tens? Like So in other words, I guess what's, what's the uh, worst hand that we wouldn't fold? Right. So yeah, so this is like a super marginal spot. And so I actually... I have a program called Holding Resources Calculator. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, I know a lot of the solver programs and like Poker Snowy and Pio, but no, I don't know this one. Tell us about it. Well, so it's preflop only, and it just basically um, calculates your preflop equity um, in whatever situation that you give it. And so I plug this hand in there, and so it, it doesn't account for any sort of post-flop considerations whatsoever. But just in terms of like your pre flop equities. And so I put this hand in and, um, you know, I, I plugged in all the variables. So I allowed for, you know, flat calls and then I allowed for a three bet to 10 big blinds, which is the sizing that the small blind chose. And so it, it gave me an interesting result. And again, I'm not completely super familiar with the algorithm that this program uses. Um, but I'm assuming that it, you know, has, I guess, the assumption that all the players are playing a relatively quote-unquote GTO style. So it makes assumptions that everyone is doing, like, what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so it tells me that the three better, um, when they're choosing that sizing of 10 big blinds, they're supposed to have a very, very narrow range. Like, according to Holden Resources Calculator, they're really only supposed to be doing that with aces, nines, ace queen suited, and ace jack suited. And everything above that, they're shoving, and, and everything uh, below that, they're folding. Yeah, so against that specific range, uh, which I find a little questionable, by the way, but if, if that's the range that it's that it's using, then eights aren't doing so well. Yeah, so that's the thing, though. Like, You would think eights are really not doing so well. But then when you look at what I'm supposed to do after they do that, I'm supposed to jam nines plus, um, ace jack suited plus, ace king off. Um, but it actually wants me to call pocket eights. That's like the, that's like the bottom of my range, like the absolute bottom of my range that Holden Resources Calculator would like me to call in this situation, which is like super interesting, right? That is incredibly interesting. So if I understand you correctly, according to this program that, by the way, everyone knows I, I'm not familiar with that program and I'm not endorsing it, but you no, know, me neither. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But assuming the numbers, uh, you know, have some basis in mathematical game theory, um, you're supposed to shove nines and yes. fold sevens. Yes. And the only hand you're really calling with is, Eights and like ace jack suited. Um, so eights, ace ten suited, ace queen off, and uh, king ten suited. Okay. Like to, it likes to call those hands very specific hands. And again, this is only free flop. It doesn't account for like, for example, like how difficult it would be to play the hand post flop, which I think merits a lot of consideration because if you have pocket eights, you're generally gonna get a flop with an overcard, right? 
Yeah, it's so, going to be very hard to play, and you've already put in 25% of your stack, and you have what we think may be an aggressive opponent, although, again, we only have seven hands of a tiny sample size here. Yeah, I just think we set ourselves up to get outplayed a lot if we flat. I know this program is telling you otherwise, but I would actually prefer folding to calling. Yeah, so, I mean, I thought about it, and it, the other consideration is that we do have still the button player behind us, and I feel like... If we were to call, then it would definitely induce a call from that player because he's shown to be very cally as well. So that's another two cards that are potential over cards to the eight that we're going to have to contend with. So, yeah, um, I don't know if you want me to tell you what I did. Yeah, now, now's a great time to tell us what you did. <laughs> so I ended up folding. So this is a pretty anticlimactic hand, actually. <laughs> no, I mean, well, I mean, according to your uh, program there, it, it, if calling is okay, but it doesn't really take into account how hard the hand is going to play, and sevens is a fold, then folding eights can't be a big mistake, right? No, well, and I think it, it is a situation where just, yeah, the playability post-flop definitely dictates a fold or shove situation. Like, I don't think that any of the hands that it's suggesting that you call with could really be played profitably post-flop in any you know, in any of those situations. I mean, you're just too close to pot commitment. You've already put in a quarter of your stack, and I'm supposed to sit here and try to flop something with king-10 suited. That just seems a little ambitious to me. I understand we're going to have position on the uh, squeeze, you know, the small blind squeezer, but yeah. still, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know if I can get behind a call here. So I don't mind a fold. I would shove, but... Yeah, I'm surprised that there's any solver type of program out there that would advocate for just calling with this hand. But uh, that just shows how much I have to learn, I think. Well, but see, that's the thing. It's not really like a solver per se. So it's a preflop equity calculator. Right, right. So it's not really accounting for whatever might happen, like over the course of actually playing the hand out. It's just in terms of like you have X amount of equity versus the other hands that these people might have, like strictly in the preflop space, I guess. Well, I take um, it we, we haven't plugged this into a solver yet, right? But I think that if yeah. we do, it's probably going to give us a mix between folding and shoving. Yeah, so so I actually I did some preliminary stuff with that and yeah, like I feel like nines, the solver definitely has nines as the bottom of the range for what they want to go ahead and shove. And yeah, like pretty much no uh no flatting range in that spot. Yeah. I feel like it's just a spot that comes up really frequently and is is often kind of confusing. And you get in those spots a lot where you're just not really sure what to do. And, like, I think it makes sense once you kind of talk it out to kind of consider, like, your position in hand and the stack sizes and the play real, playability post-flop. So, yeah. Yeah, and also... Another thing to consider is that although late registration is still available, if we're getting towards the end of that period, um, you know, busting now and having to buy back in again might be a pure gamble because, I mean, how many big blinds are you even going to have? I mean, you're at you're almost at an average stack now, but what will you get when you re-enter? It's probably going to be pretty low, right? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what it was at, at that point in this particular tournament. Um, but, yeah, definitely late reg goes until, I think... On ignition, it goes until you can have like ten big lines. That would be the last level of late red. So <laughs> that would that would be a bit gambling, I would think. Yeah, for sure. Well, no, that's a. I mean, that's a very interesting spot. And uh, I remember reading a cash game book many years ago, written by Davis Glansky, uh, "No Limit Hold'em Theory and Practice." That was a book that kind of changed the way I I look at. It's not actually a, a cash game book, by the way, but it just it, a lot of the tournament, a lot of the tournament considerations don't really get addressed as as much as they do in some of his other work. Um, but yeah, I was, you know, I'm from the old school, like before there were such a thing as training sites. We used to have to like read actual textbooks to figure out how to play the game. Um, but yeah, something that comes up in that book, which I think is still true, at least uh, from a mathematical standpoint, is that in a cash game you might even limp. Uh, with this hand, if you feel like people behind you are likely to three bet if you raise, it's better to limp and then you can call that raise and still have plenty of chips behind to basically turn your hand into trying to flop a set. So you're basically set mining with eights 
at that point. But you know the way it works when you're in a in a shorter stack situation like we usually have in tournaments, you're only playing 40 bigs. Like in a cash game, you'd probably have 100 or maybe 200 bigs. So in this situation, once you raise and get three bet, you can't really call and try to flop an eight because you already put in a quarter of your stack. And you're not going to flop an eight often enough to make up for losing those 10 bigs. So it really becomes, uh, do we want to go with this hand or not? And it's interesting. This, the uh, the program says your best bet is to shove nines and fold sevens. So what should we do with eights? I don't think calling is a compromise. So, uh, yeah, and I doubt that, like you said, I don't think the solvers would have us calling either. So you took the conservative approach, and, uh, yeah, obviously there's there's nothing wrong with that. Especially because, you know, like you say, the tournament, generally speaking, is fairly soft. Why do we need to shove eights here and then sometimes run into the overpair and have to buy in again and have like 15 big blinds or whatever when we could just fold this and, and pick a better time to, to get all the money in? Yeah, and I think, I mean, what you said about like having like a limp calling, like a limp and then calling a raise strategy, like you don't see that a lot in in current tournament play. Um, but that's actually an interesting thing to consider. I mean, I've literally never considered doing that before. And that, I mean, it, it wouldn't be for necessarily set mining purposes. I, I feel like eights is a strong enough hand that, you know, you can go to a flop, especially for like three, four big blinds and, you know, kind of play aggressively post flop depending on, on how things go. But, um, I like that sort of like outside of the box, thinking, you know, like, oh, maybe you could do, like, this really random, you know, kind of, like, limp call thing, or you could, like, limp re-raise, or, you know, thinking thinking outside of, like, the way that normal people think, and outside of the way that solvers think, is, I think, the way that you might ultimately be able to gain an edge over um, the field, I, I, I guess, in yeah. modern paper. Yeah, for sure. I mean... The the downside of limping is that you're not going to steal the blinds and antes, and they're so valuable uh, when you have 40 big blinds. Just to be clear, I'm not really advocating that we should be limping uh, at this stage of the tournament with 40 bigs, but certainly in a cash game, if you had a bigger stack and you think that you're so likely to get three bet and you don't want to have to put in like, you know, in a cash game, it might end up being like, let's say 8% of your stack before the flop with eights against an opponent that's you know pretty strong post flop and it's going to be hard to outplay him or her that's that's not an ideal spot and so sometimes at certain cash game tables uh you know as as I'm taking from this Sklansky book I read all those years ago sometimes at, at, a, at a, particularly in a deeper stack situation like early in the main event uh in the World Series poker main event or uh in a deep stack cash game situation I think limp calling with medium pairs from early position is definitely a viable strategy and a profitable at times, even when you don't flop your eight. So it's not a pure set mind situation. Like it would be had you done the same with like pocket fours or something, but yeah, it's uh, I agree with you kind of generally about thinking outside the box and trying to find things that maybe even the solvers aren't really tinkering with yet because the solvers only calculate the options that we give them. Right, So the solver isn't going to say, well, what's the value of limping here? Unless you say, hey, solver, can you please include limping in your considerations? You know, And just almost none of us ever do that because for so many years you could spot the fish at the table because he's the guy who limps in. <laughs> it used to be that easy. Well, yeah, and I mean these days – so you know, it used to be you could spot the fish if he was um, you know, what you call donk betting or leading on the flop, right? Yeah, yeah, it's another one. You know, solvers these days are recommending a lot of flop leads with, like, you know, some stuff. And um, you can kind of tell, like, when you see you've got, you know, an aggressive opponent and they're from Germany and, you know, they're defending their big blind and then leading out two-thirds pot on the flop. And you're like, wait a minute, what are they doing? Like, yeah. This is a solver thing. Like, the solver told them be doing this kind of stuff yeah especially if, if it's someone from germany i'm going to give that player the benefit of the doubt and assume that that he or she has spent a lot of time with the solver coming up with these strategies because that seems to be what the germans do <laughs> while exactly. you while while you and i are playing scrabble and boggle they're just running 
Pio left and right all day long. <laughs> I know. How are we going to keep up? It's not fair. Yeah, we're not going to keep up. We're going to stay on ignition and make some money. <laughs> Can't argue with that. That seems like a good strategy too. Yeah. So before we say goodbye, is there anything uh, else that you wanted our listeners to know about you, or are you on Twitch or anything like that, or where else can we see you? No, you know, I I used to do Twitch a number of years ago, but um, I haven't done it recently. But I, I've I've been kind of thinking about getting back into it. So maybe you know, look out, you know, watch my Twitter. If I uh, if I do decide to go back on Twitch, I will definitely announce it to the world. Yeah, well, if you're not following her now, make sure you follow her on Twitter. It's at the groupie, and uh, it, she's a first-time guest. I think it was a really, really entertaining conversation. I just want to thank you, Elena, for for being with us today. Well, thank you for the invite. This was fun, and um, yeah, good luck, everybody. Yeah, good luck out there, and so for Elena Stover and for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. Fuck!